Hello and welcome to this presentation about designing high-performance kit driver systems for silicon carbide MOSFETs with the new transformer series WE ATDT. My name is Eliazar Falco and I'm an applications engineer at Burd Electronic. So here is the agenda. We will start with a short introduction of silicon carbide technology. And after that, we will go through some key considerations for driving silicon carbide MOSFETs. We will also learn why in some cases a negative gate drive voltage is required to reliably turn off the device. And we will also gain an understanding of CMTI, which is a critical parameter in silicon carbide MOSFET systems. You will often find this parameter mentioned in marketing campaigns of silicon carbide gate driver ICs. Moving on, we will see some important considerations related to the isolated auxiliary power supply of the system. And we'll introduce the new WE HDT auxiliary gate drive transformer series from Burt Electronic, which can help you bring your silicon carbide gate driver system to the next performance level. These transformers come with ready to use reference designs, which you can easily integrate into your gate driver system. We will then conclude this presentation with an overview of target applications of silicon carbide MOSFETs and a short summary of the key takeaways from the presentation. Okay, so let's get started with a quick overview of silicon carbide technology. Silicon carbide, like gallium nitride, is a wide band gap material. Going a bit into atomic theory, the energy band gap is the energy which needs to be provided to an electron in the valence band so that it can jump to the conduction band, reducing so the resistivity of the material. For conductors like copper or gold, the valence and conduction bands overlap and there are plenty of free electrons to conduct at room temperature. At the other extreme, isolating materials like glass feature very high band gap energy which makes it very difficult for its electrons to jump to the conduction band. In between, we find semiconductor materials with a moderate band gap energy level. For silicon, for example, this is around 1.1 electron volt. And here is the relationship between electron volt and joule, the traditional energy unit. For silicon carbide, the band gap energy is around 3.3 electron volt and for GAN, 3.5 electron volt. They both have around three times wider energy band gap than silicon, and so are called wide band gap materials. The special properties of these materials help to build MOSFETs and diodes with better characteristics. Silicon carbide, for example, features better thermal conductivity, higher electron saturation velocity, and a higher electric field breakdown than standard silicon. All of them contributing to the superior performance of this type of devices. The question is then, how do all these superior material properties translate into better semiconductor devices? Well, let's have a look at some of the performance metrics of silicon carbide based MOSFETs. They feature the highest breakdown voltages up to 1,700 volt and are capable of operating at up to 200 degrees Celsius of junction temperature. It's good to mention here that this is actually limited by packaging, like bonding material limit, not by the semiconductor die itself. In fact, the die could operate at over 400 degrees Celsius. Also, the die size is smaller for a specific breakdown voltage, which also helps to lower the total gate charge. The conduction resistance, RDSON, is also lower and highly stable with temperature. Let's see now some of the advantages that silicon carbide devices can bring to your application. The first of them is increasing the power density, especially in high voltage, high power converters. Another important advantage is a much faster switching speed capability, over 10 times faster than silicon. 
This results in higher efficiency as switching losses are reduced. The power converter can also be operated at higher switching frequencies, which reduces the size and cost of magnetics and capacitors in the power system. Even the cooling system can be downsized in some cases. As a result, a lower overall system cost can be achieved, as well as a more compact form factor. Last but not least, the higher operating temperature capability and lower thermal resistance further increase the power rating and improves reliability and robustness of target applications. Some of these applications can operate at above 300 kilowatt of power. Okay, so now that we know the main advantages of SIG technology, let's go through some key considerations to drive silicon carbide MOSFET devices. Here, we have a typical isolated gate driver system for silicon carbide MOSFETs with an integrated gate driver IC block and an auxiliary power supply block. The gate driver IC receives the PWM control signal from the controller and passes it through the isolation barrier in the input stage to control the totem pole transistor output stage. There is a high side and a low side transistor for turning the SIG MOSFET on and off respectively. Galvanic isolation in the auxiliary power supply is achieved by means of a transformer. This supply typically provides two output voltage rails, like in this case, one positive to fully turn on the SIG device and one negative to reliably turn it off. Right, so what we observe is that this structure is quite similar to gate drivers for IGBTs or silicon power MOSFETs. However, since silicon carbide devices can switch much faster, very important requirements need to be considered. This is due to the very high rate of change of voltage, abbreviated as DV by DT, which is generated during the fast switching transitions. Also an important point to mention here is that some high performance silicon carbide MOSFET devices, they feature an additional low inductance Kelvin source pin as highlighted here in the image. This connection should be used for the gate current loop return path as it allows for increased control robustness and faster switching speeds. Let's take now a closer look at the switching of the SIG MOSFET in a bit more detail. Firstly, we can replace the gate to source terminal of the SIG device by an equivalent variable gate capacitance. This capacitance depends on some operating parameters, like, for example, the drain to source voltage being switched. In the images, R on and R off are the total resistance of the gate current loop on turn on and turn off transitions respectively. L on and L, L off also represent the parasitic inductances of the respective gate current loops. During the turn on switching transition, the gate driver high side switch conducts and the low side is open. In this case, the output capacitance of the positive rail of the auxiliary supply provides, provides the charge required to the gate capacitance. During turn off of the SIG MOSFET, the high side switch of the gate driver is open and the low side switch conducts, connecting the gate terminal to the negative rail voltage of the auxiliary supply. The gate capacitance discharges then to minus VEE voltage level. It is important to mention that the parasitic inductance will limit the rate of rise and fall of the gate current, di by dt, and with it increasing the switching transition time, in addition to other negative effects, which we will see later on. All right, so as mentioned, a specific amount of electric charge needs to be provided to the gate capacitance during turn on switch transition and removed during turn off. How fast this is done 
will determine the switching time. Let's see now a simplified calculation example for the turn on switching transition of a silicon carbide MOSFET device. Here, we are assuming at first that the parasitic inductance of the gate loop is zero. In such a case, the peak current required to switch the SIG MOSFET is simply the gate charge divided by the switching time. The gate charge information can be obtained directly from the silicon carbide MOSFET data sheet. In this example, when using plus 15 volt for turn on and minus 4 volt for turn off, the total voltage swing is 19 volt. And the required gate charge for the selected device is 9.3 nanocoulomb. If we want a fast switching transition of, let's say, 5 nanoseconds, for example, then the required gate current peak would be calculated as 1.86 amp. However, this is assuming that there is no parasitic inductance and that the current can change instantaneously, which in reality is not the case. The parasitic inductance will slow down the rate of rise of the current, di by dt, and with it, the charge transfer rate, increasing the switching time, as we mentioned. In order to compensate for this, a small percentage factor can be added to the calculated current peak requirement. In this example, we can apply a 20% factor to the calculated value, and then the peak current requirement will finally be 2.25 amp. This could be the current sourcing requirement for the gate driver IC, and it's a good starting point. However, we need to verify this later on on the bench in the lab, since we don't really know at this stage how much parasitic inductance there is. It is important to note that this current peak also sets a limit to the maximum turn on gate resistance. This includes not only the external resistor, but also the parasitic resistances of packages, and the maximum value is calculated as shown here. Now, once this is done, we can repeat a similar procedure for the turn off switching transition. And with it, we will obtain the sync current requirement of the gate driver IC. After that, we can now look for a gate driver IC with the required driving strength or iterate further if our specification is not feasible for the available gate driver ICs. Uh, it is important that we need to keep in mind again that this is the starting point only. We need to validate this experimentally and find a trade-off taking into account efficiency, EMI performance, thermals, cost, and size of the solution. Now, if we are using a silicon carbide MOSFET, it's because we want to switch fast in order to achieve higher efficiency, smaller solution size, and lower cost, most likely. However, a fast switching can have some negative effects, which, if not careful, might end up offsetting the mentioned advantages. In the image, we can now see a gate, a gate current loop circuit example, which is for the turn off switching transition of the SIG MOSFET. The typical parasitic capacitances of the device, CGS, CGD, and CDS, are also shown. One thing we know is that in order to achieve fast switching, the gate resistance and parasitic loop inductance values must both be kept low, so that to obtain the necessary high peak gate current and the high DI by DT. However, too low of a gate resistance can cause important issues. In fact, if we look at the gate current loop, we can identify a serious RLC resonance circuit. This is formed by the gate loop resistance, parasitic loop inductance, and gate capacitance. If we set the gate resistance too low, for example, then the quality factor of the RLC network might be rather high. 
leading to an underdamped response to an input voltage step. The result of this will be ringing, overshoot, undershoot during the switching transitions. This not only generates more EMI noise levels, but can also reduce the efficiency as switching losses will increase. In addition to this, the maximum and minimum dynamic gate source voltage ratings of the silicon carbide MOSFET could also be exceeded with the overshoot and undershoot. So we need to be careful in this regard. And most importantly, because this is exacerbated with the faster switching speeds of silicon carbide devices. So what we should do first is trying to reduce the parasitic inductance as much as possible. And if this is still not enough, we might need to slow down the switching speed either by increasing the gate resistor value or by using a small ferrite bit, for example, the CBF series from Booth Electronic. Also, a small external gate source capacitor can also help here. Okay, so let's see now an example of this in an LT spy simulation. This is of a synchronous back converter operating at 500 kilohertz and 40% duty cycle. And we are going to monitor the gate source voltage of the synchronous switch of the back converter, which is driven with an unipolar voltage of 15 volt. The only, cha the only cha change will be for the gate parasitic loop inductance. On the left, it will be 15 nanohenry, and on the right, 10 nanohenry. And here are the results. The waveform in green is the gate drive control signal of the synchronous switch, and in red, the gate drive control signal of the high side switch of the back converter. In blue, we see the voltage right at the gate source terminals of the synchronous device. With a parasitic inductance of 15 nanohenry, there is considerable ringing and the overshoot reaches 24 volt, which is 9 volt above the drive voltage. For a lower parasitic inductance of 10 nanohenry, the overshoot is only 3 volt above driver voltage and no ringing is observed. So with this, we can again see that for driving fast switching sick MOSFET devices, where high dB by dt is generated, minimizing the gate loop parasitic inductance is much more critical than with the standard silicon applications, which switch much slower. Right, so what can we do to minimize the gate loop parasitic inductance? Right, so first, we remember that inductance is directly proportional to the area enclosed by a current. So looking at the gate current loop for turn on and turn off of the SIG device, we can see that the first and most important thing we need to do is to minimize the area of these loops. Since the gate current has high harmonic content, we need to provide a current return path as close as possible to the gate current PCB traces. A small plane on a different PCB layer right underneath the gate current traces is therefore recommended. Another important consideration is to place the auxiliary power supply with its output capacitors very close to the gate driver IC and the silicon carbide MOSFET device. Let's not forget that these capacitors provide the high peak currents required to charge and discharge the gate capacitance of the silicon carbide MOSFET. We also need to use short and wide traces for the connections, since the inductance increases with trace length. And another aspect which might be easily overlooked is the effect of the parasitic inductance of component packages. It is recommended to select small surface mount components, for example, Multilayer ceramic capacitors, MLCCs, like the CSGP series from Burt Electronic, which feature extremely low package inductance. 
a particular point regarding gate driver ICs, be it single channel or multi channel, is that we will come across two options. Some devices feature a single gate drive output pin, while others feature two one connected to the internal high side switch and the other output connected to the internal low side switch as shown in the images. The two output option allows to directly set different turn on and turn off resistors. And in this way, to adjust the switching speed as required. So why do we want this? Well, the turn on and turn off switching transitions can have different impact on EMI and efficiency. And this depending on the circuit topology used and the operating conditions. Like for example, if it is hard switching or soft switching, discontinuous conduction mode operation, etc. We can still obtain this functionality, however, with a single output gate drive IC, but an anti-parallel diode will be needed as shown in the image. This has the drawback that the additional voltage drop of the diode during the turn off transition, which can negatively impact switching performance. A gate to source resistor is also typically used to hold the silicon carbide device reliably in an off state when the gate driver output is floating. This happens, for example, during the startup and shutdown events. This is similar to silicon based gate drivers. And although it might look strange at first, we can also add a small gate source capacitance in order to improve turn off robustness against Miller effect, which we will explain next in detail. These capacitance can even reduce the ringing during the switching transition. Okay, let's see now why many silicon carbide applications similar to IGBT gate drivers and negative turn off voltage is used. So here is the building block of many power conversion systems, two or more silicon carbide MOSFET devices in a half bridge configuration with a high side switch and a low side switch typically connected to power ground. This structure can be easily identified in synchronous switching power supplies, like for example, synchronous buck and boost converters. This is also widely used in single and multi layer and multi-phase inverters. Typically, each silicon carbide MOSFET has its separate auxiliary power supply. The node in between the devices is the switching node, which in the typical applications holds very fast voltage swings from ground to a potentially high voltage during the switching transitions. This generates very high dB by dt across the terminals of both silicon carbide devices, whose consequences we will see next. And here for reference is a simplified example application of a three-phase motor inverter which is built up from three silicon carbide MOSFET half bridge blocks in parallel. Right, so this serves us to introduce the Miller effect, which might occur in this type of configurations. The Miller effect corresponds to the turn on of a MOSFET due to current flow through the Miller capacitance, CGD. So let's see how and when this could happen. Firstly, we know the relationship between voltage and current in a capacitor. The instantaneous displacement current in the capacitor is proportional to the rate of change of the voltage across its terminals, dB by dt. The constant of proportionality is the capacitance value itself. Now, looking at the equivalent model of a SIG MOSFET with the parasitic capacitances, in this case, for example, the low side device in a half bridge configuration, we can observe that during the switching transitions, the high dB by dt generated in the switch node is actually being applied across the gate drain capacitance, also known as middle capacitance, and also the equivalent impedance across gate source terminals of the device. This will cause a current flow through these two impedances. 
We can see that, in fact, we have an impedance divider as shown in the image. And depending on the dB by dt and the ratio of the gate drain impedance to the gate source impedance, it might happen that the gate source voltage glitch generated by the Miller current momentarily makes the gate source threshold voltage of the silicon carbide MOSFET exceeds the, the turn on value and the SIG MOSFET will be switched on. To prevent this, the gate source impedance must be much lower than the gate drain impedance during the turn off switching transition. So let's see this happening with the help of another LT spy simulation. This is a synchronous back converter, and the low side switch is driven with a unipolar voltage of 15 volt. We will focus here on the turn off of the low side device and the turn on of the high side device switching transition. And the waveform shown, waveforms shown here will be the high side and low side gate control voltages the low side MOSFET gate source voltage and its drain source current. And here we have the results. We can see the typical dead time used, which is a time window during which both switches are off and the body diode or external diode of the low side switch is conducting the current. This is used to ensure that switching overlap in cross conduction does not occur. During the turn on transition of the high side device, a very high rising dV by dt on the switch node is generated. And due to the Miller effect explained previously, we see now how the gate source voltage of the low side device momentarily exceeds the turn on threshold voltage, causing a shoot through event. For an instant, both devices are turned on at the same time effectively shorting the high voltage rail to ground. The instantaneous peak current is only limited by rather small parasitic inductance and resistance of the current loop. And so its value might be extremely high. This event typically causes lower efficiency and higher operating temperature with the corresponding reduction in reliability and lifetime of the devices. In severe cases, early damage of the devices can also occur. So here is the same configuration, but now we are applying a negative voltage of minus four volt to turn off the low side silicon carbide MOSFET. And we can see now how the amplitude of the gate source voltage glitch is approximately the same, has not changed. However, with the negative offset provided by the negative voltage rail of the auxiliary power supply, the low side device stays off and no Miller induced turn on and shoot through occurs. So by applying a negative turn off voltage, the turn off transition is more robust and reliable, especially when very high dB by dt is generated. This also allows for faster switching speeds. The example given here was for the low side MOSFET device of the half bridge configuration, but the same happens to the high side device on turn off. Now we can still use a unipolar voltage drive with high dB by dt. However, we might need an active Miller clamp to prevent Miller effect turn on. As we can see in the image, this is in reality a transistor, internal or external to the gate driver IC. This transistor is connected directly to the gate terminal of the silicon carbide MOSFET. As the gate source voltage drops below a set threshold level, the Miller transistor is turned on and shunts the Miller current through a very low impedance path. In fact, much lower than the equivalent gate source impedance, therefore preventing Miller induced turn on. But not only that, an active Miller clamp has also the additional advantage of reducing ringing and undershoot of the gate source voltage. It makes it possible 
to use unipolar driving voltages even with high dB by dt. And here is an example of a gate driver IC which features active mirror clamp. Right, so let's learn now a bit more about CMTI and why it is a critical parameter for silicon carbide gate driver systems. Right, so CMTI stands for Common Mode Transient Immunity. It is measured in volt per nanosecond or kilovolt per, per, per microsecond and indicates the maximum rate of change of voltage, dB by dt, which can be applied across the isolation barrier of the gate driver system before malfunction and loss of control occurs. In order to gain an intuitive understanding of the concept, we take the high side MOSFET of a half bridge configuration, whose source terminal is directly connected to the switch node, producing the very high dB by dt. We have simplified and replaced the gate driver IC in auxiliary power supply by an equivalent by their equivalent capacitances across the isolation barrier. This will be the primary to secondary interwinding capacitance of the transformer for the auxiliary power supply and the parasitic capacitance of the digital isolator or integrated signal isolation stage of the gate drive IC. The source of the device is directly connected to the transformer's secondary winding in a displacement current will flow across the interwinding capacitance to the primary side of the power supply. The high dV by dt on the switch node also AC couples current through the parasitic capacitance of the gate driver IC. The effect of these displacement currents, if they are high enough, will be a considerable distortion of the control signals, leading to loss of control of the silicon carbide device. The lower the total parasitic capacitance across the isolation barrier, the lower the displacement currents which will be generated. And so a higher CMTI rating will be achieved, increasing with it the robustness of the system. So a very low isolation barrier capacitance does not only help to achieve a higher common mode transient immunity rating, but also better EMI performance. In the simplified system image, we can observe a potential AC coupling path for the common mode current. This current is generated by the very high dB by dt, which appears between the switch node and earth chassis in its switching transition. CPT is the total capacitance across the isolation barrier with gate driver IC and auxiliary power supply combined. We can also find a simplified input common mode filter with LCM being the equivalent common mode inductance of the common mode shock and the Y capacitor helping to shunt the common mode current to earth chassis away from the EMI measurement equipment. It is important to note that the amplitude of the harmonics of the voltage square waveform on the switch node strongly depends depends on the rise time and in turn on the dB by dt of the switching voltage. A lower parasitic capacitance will present higher impedance to the circulating common mode currents, reducing in turn the current flowing to the EMI measurement equipment for conducted emissions and the ripple voltage across the Y capacitor. We also need to minimize them in order to prevent radiated EMI from system input output wires or PCB traces. In summary, a lower parasitic capacitance can help to achieve better EMI performance and also to lower the input filter requirements. Okay, let's move on now to some important considerations for the auxiliary power supply of the gate driver system. So the first question is, how much output power do we need from the auxiliary power supply? Right, so the answer is right as much power as it is dissipated in the gate drive path resistance during the switching transitions of the silicon carbide MOSFET. We remember 
that for turn on and off of the SIG device, we are actually charging and discharging the gate capacitance. So we need to consider the energy required for this, which is the same for turn on and for turn off switching transitions. For each of them, this is half of the required gate charge multiplied by the applied gate source voltage swing. So we add them together to obtain the energy dissipated in a full switching cycle, and then multiply this value by the switching frequency to obtain the power. It is important to see that it does not depend on the gate resistance. So this power requirement can increase in some cases, like when switching at higher frequencies, or when using some very high power custom silicon carbide power modules with a high gate capacitance. These modules are used, for example, in some powertrain traction inverters. Also, when paralleling SIG MOSFET devices for current sharing, as shown in the image. In this case, instead of a separate auxiliary supply for each device, they can share one. This is typical and it can help to increase the reliability of the devices as they can run cooler. The power output of the application can also be increased in this way. However, important considerations need to be taken into account when paralleling SIG MOSFET devices, like signal propagation delay or impedance mismatch of the gate current loops. Another scenario where the auxiliary supply could be shared is in the low side MOSFET of, a, of an inverter application. Okay, so let's make now a simple calculation example. We select for this the silicon carbide power module CAS120M12 from Wolf Speed, and our application will have a target switching frequency of 150 kilohertz. We will use a bipolar drive voltage of plus 15 volt and minus 4 volt. With this, the gate source voltage swing will be 19 volt. For the gate charts, we have the information in the data sheet. It is normally specified in a table under some specific test conditions. For this device, the voltage swing tested was plus 20 volt minus 5 volt. If using a different gate source drive voltage, like in this case, we can go to the gate charge curve in the same data sheet and graphically estimate the amount of gate charge here. For plus 15 volt and minus 4 volt, the gate charge will be around 280 nanocoulomb. And with this, we will require 1.62 watt of power from the auxiliary supply. Good to mention, this is a good starting point, but remember that the gate charge depends on operating conditions. So we will need to validate this later on experimentally. Right, so we will need an isolated power supply, which is small, cost-effective, and which enables a high enough CMTI rating of the system, and which can provide bipolar output voltages as well. For this, we have different options, each with its advantages and its disadvantages. So let's have a look at some of them. We have first the push-pull converter in which the transformer transfers the energy to the secondary side without storing it first. And so very small size and low profile transformers can be used. For example, the mid PPTI, PPMAX, and PPLT from Wurf Electronic. The input voltage and duty cycle are both fixed and the output voltage is unregulated in this topology, since the operation is typically open loop. So we might need to add additional output voltage regulation stages like load dropout regulators or center shunts. Another option is the isolated half bridge converter, whose advantages are very similar to the push-pull converter, but normally the component count is higher and the control more complex. Since now we have a high side switch as well to be driven. 
but this is still another good option for the auxiliary power supply of silicon carbide kit driver systems. Then we have the primary side regulated flight back converter, which features many advantages, like a wide input voltage range, a regulated output voltage with no need for additional voltage regulation stages like low dropout regulators. And this topology does not require either any additional primary winding. The component count is low and the complete solution is small and cost effective, even though the transformer here is used as an energy storage device. Some example of controllers for primary cell regulated flyback are the LM5180 from Texas Instruments or the LT83 series from analog devices. And for the transformer, the new WE AGDT auxiliary gate drive transformers from Burt Electronic, which we will introduce next. So here are the main features of these new transformers from Burt Electronic. They are built in a very small EP7 form factor bobbin and feature extremely low interwinding capacitance down to 6.8 picofarad. This might help to achieve gate driver system CMTI common mode transient immunity ratings of over 100 volt per nanosecond for state-of-the-art silicon carbide applications. They also feature 4 kilovolt dielectric isolation and are surface mount devices, pick and place ready, which helps to reduce the manufacturing costs. They also comply with relevant IEC standards and have ACQ 200 qualification whose tests are currently ongoing. They have been designed and optimized to be used in auxiliary gate driver power supplies with primary side regulated flyback topology and up to six watt output power. They offer two secondary winding options, one with bipolar voltage rails and the other with a single unipolar voltage rail. So these series are optimized for driving silicon carbide MOSFETs, but they are also exceptional for IGBT and silicon power MOSFET devices alike. Right, so there are currently three transformers in the WE AGDT series with bipolar output voltage rails. The output voltages are plus 15 volt for SIG MOSFET turn on and minus four volt for turn off. They cover an input voltage range from 9 volt to 36 volts and an output power up to 6 watt in the case of the 7503-18131 device. Reference designs are also available. And here for your reference, there are some of the state-of-the-art silicon carbide MOSFET devices from different manufacturers, which are suitable to use with the bipolar output WE AGDT transformers. But this is only a sample, there are many more. Okay, so equally, there are currently three WE AGDT transformers available with unipolar output voltage rail configuration. The output voltage can be adjusted from 15 volt to 20 volt as required. They cover an input voltage range from 9 volt to 36 volt and output power up to 6 watt. The reference designs available feature a 19 volt output voltage, but as mentioned, this can be modified as needed. And here for your reference, an example device series in which a unipolar gate drive voltage is recommended in the data sheet. And just to mention, please watch out since more reference designs with different output voltages will be coming soon. Right, so let's see now an example reference design and gate driver system integration board. So Burt Electronics has made this reference design with the LT8302 controller from analog devices. The input voltage range 
is from 9 volt to 18 volt and it is using the WE HDDT 7503181131 bipolar output transformer. It provides output voltages of plus 15 volt and minus 4 volt and output power up to 6 watt. It features a peak efficiency of 86% and it is extremely compact and lightweight as it can be appreciated in the images. Two options for the bill of materials are provided. One with all ACQ qualified components, for example, for e-mobility applications, and the other with standard components. The board is also available in two different PCB layout versions. A two-layer design with components on top side only, and a smaller four-layer design with components on top and bottom sides. This is the one shown in the pictures here. All right, so let's see some experimental results of this reference design. Here we can see the load regulation of the positive output voltage rail for different input voltages. It can be observed how it stays tightly regulated at 14.9 volt over the full line and load range. Here, we can now see the load regulation of the negative output voltage rail for different input voltages. The same, it can be observed how it stays tightly regulated, in this case, between minus 3.8 volt and minus 3.9 volt over the full line and load range. And here we have the power efficiency over line and load. It is observed it is observed how for the nominal input voltage, 12 volts, for example, it stays above 85% for most of the load current range and even above 83% at full load, 6 watt. So the PCB fabrication and layout files in Altium Designer are available to download on Burt Electronic website. In addition, a detailed reference design document and an application note are also available as support documentation. So please take advantage of all these resources for your silicon carbide gate driver system. All right, so here is an example of a gate driver system board for driving a half-bridge silicon carbide MOSFET building block. We already introduced this previously in this presentation. And in this case, instead of a single high side and a single low side silicon carbide MOSFET device, two parallel devices are used in each case. So we have four gate channels in total. So these are the high side and the low side gate driver systems. And here are the two layer version of the six watt bipolar isolated auxiliary supply reference design from Burt Electronic. This is the isolation barrier. And here we're using a discrete gate driver system with separate digital isolator IC and a gate drive IC. Here we can see the digital isolators. And here are the gate driver ICs, the high side and the low side, and the turn on and turn off gate resistors for each of the four channels. Right, so let's see now an overview of the main present and future applications of silicon carbide technology. So here we have e-mobility powertrain, onboard and offboard chargers, solar inverters, industrial drives, data center power, as well as general switch mode power supplies and power factor correlation stages. All right, so let's see a small summary of what we have seen in, in this presentation. A silicon carbide MOSFET has superior performance characteristics than comparable silicon-based devices like IGBT or power MOSFETs. Silicon carbide devices can also switch much faster and help to achieve higher efficiency, smaller size, and lower overall system cost solutions. 
into the most important gate driver design considerations, we remember that we mentioned to minimize the gate loop parasitic inductance and also to optimally adjust the gate resistance. We also learned why a negative gate source voltage allows for a faster and more robust turn off at high dB by dt, which is very common in silicon carbide applications. All right, we already understood the importance of lower isolation barrier parasitic capacitance to achieve higher common mode transient immunity, so higher control, robustness, and even a better EMI performance. We introduced the new compact WE AGDT auxiliary gate drive transformer series from Burt Electronic, suitable for silicon carbide and IGBT applications. These transformers, we remember, feature extremely low interwinding capacitance, helping to achieve high CMTI ratings over 100 volt per nanosecond and up to 6 watt gate drive system power. Reference designs are available, ready to use, and easy to integrate in your gate drive system. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send them in because we are most happy to help you. Thank you again. Goodbye.